Good morning. morning. Really glad to see all of you here on a holiday weekend. So nice of you to carve time out to join together. And I just want to tell you how encouraging it was to hear worship lifted in this house this morning. I just love hearing the voices of God's people declaring what's true about our Heavenly Father. Amen? Amen. Um, So have you ever been in an earthquake or experienced any seismic activity? I was actually in California when they had uh, a significant tremor, and uh, those of you who know my superpower is oblivion, (laughs) and I missed it. People were very excited, and they were talking very quickly and loudly and very excited about all the the shaking that had occurred. I missed it entirely. Uh, I am sure that there are levels that an earthquake could reach that even I could not ignore. There's something called a rector scale. A rector scale is a way to um, kind of measure the strength and intensity of an earthquake. And uh, if, if a rector scale showed an earthquake at, at 1.0, we wouldn't feel it. It's just kind of a tremor in the ground that only machines can pick up. By the time it starts getting up to 5, everyone would feel it. At 5.5, it starts getting very dangerous, and there can be loss of life and loss of property. And uh, there are earthquakes that have been recorded as high as 9.5, and and it's logarithmic in intensity. It's not just small incremental increases. Tens of thousands of lives can be lost. So the reason I talk about that today is because there was an experience that God's people had that had a lot of seismic activity involved, and the author of Hebrews uses it to give us some very healthy perspective on our life right now, and our relationship with God. So we are in Hebrews, the 12th chapter, and it says, you've not come to a mountain that can be touched, that is burning with fire, to darkness, gloom, and storm, to a trumpet blast, or to such voice speaking words that those who heard it begged that no further word be spoken to them, because they could not bear what was commanded. If even an animal touches the mountain, it must be stoned to death. I know this sounds very strange. We'll we'll unpack it in just a minute. The sight was so terrifying that Moses said, I am trembling with fear. But you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. You have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly, to the church of the firstborn, whose names are written in heaven. You have come to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. See to it that you do not refuse him who speaks. If they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, how much less will we if we turn away from him who warns us from heaven? At that time, his voice shook the earth, but now he has promised, once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. The words once more indicate the removing of what can be shaken, that is, created things. So what cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. When you read through the book of Hebrews, it's just filled with insider language and insider stories. And if you weren't raised with all of the information from the Old Testament, this is a hard book to read. And so every week when we've talked about this, we've had to unpack some of the Old Testament references. And the reference that the author of Hebrews is making in this passage goes all the way back to Exodus 19 when God met with his people and gave them the Ten Commandments. And just before that occurred, they were called to consecrate themselves. And there came a moment when a very thick and dark cloud descended on top of Mount Sinai. And there was lightning flashes. It looked like an unbelievable storm. And the thunder was deafening and was shaking the ground. And then on top of that, there was a long, loud trumpet blast that just kept getting louder the longer that it went. And the ground under them actually began to shake. Now, I think that if we started experiencing that today, there would come a point at which people would wonder, is this not just a show anymore? Is this even safe? 
And here's what I, I think is, is kind of uh, true. I think that what was happening in that moment is the holiness of God was becoming visible and audible. And as it turns out, because of our fallen condition, our, our frailties, our, our failures, that we can't get very close to the holiness of God and, and survive that experience. We're just not built for it. So the mountain of God was so charged with the holiness, it actually said, with God's holiness, it actually says that if an animal were to wander beyond the roped off area, that the animal was to be killed at a distance with stones or arrows. And I think a lot of our assumption is, is that, well, if an animal wandered up somehow, that was corrupting the, the holiness of God and, and that animal should be killed. That's not what was actually happening. The, the animal was actually corrupted by the holiness of God. And if that animal wandered back out among people, it could be dangerous to be around. And so they wanted that animal brought down. So that was not a day that you let your pet off the leash. You kept that thing really close to you. And here's what I think is true. I think most of us wish God were like this. We want the light show. We want the sound show. We want the ground to shake beneath our feet. And we believe that if I had an experience with God like that, I would be changed forever. Well, before you settle into that thought too long, you should know that all of these people, over a million of them, that were assembled around Mount Sinai, they were not changed for even 40 days. In less than 40 days, they managed to create an image that looked like a baby cow made out of gold that they declared to be their God, and they bowed down and worshipped it and said, this is the God that brought us out of Egypt. This is what we need to know. Sinai does not have the power to change anyone. Sinai reveals the holiness of God and exposes our sinfulness, but it has no power to change anyone. So the author of Hebrews says, that's not the mountain we've been called to. We've been called to a second mountain, and the second mountain is Mount Zion. And he gives us a reference picture of this. He says, you interact or you're surrounded by thousands and thousands of angels. And Hebrews, uh, in the early chapters, actually talks about angels being God's ministering spirits sent forth to, to help produce his will in the world. And what he's saying is God is releasing angels to make sure that his will is done in our lives. And then it says we're connected with fellow believers who are all firstborns. Now let me just check. How many firstborns do we have in the room this morning? How many are something other than a firstborn? Now, uh, I won't ask the firstborns what they think of everybody who came after them. <laughs> and I won't ask everyone who came after them what they think of firstborns. But it is remarkably consistent uh, patterns of thought related to these things. In the ancient world, this meant a very different thing. In the ancient world, it wasn't just rule following or being bossy. In the ancient world, if you were the firstborn, you got the inheritance, almost all of it. There would be a little slice that was left over for everyone else. And so if you were the fifth born child in a family, you didn't get much at all. So what it tells us in this passage we just read is that we are a company, a, a, a group of firstborns. We all get the inheritance. Is that not wonderful? Mount, Mount Zion is so much better than Mount Sinai. And it says, and that we come to a God who is the judge of all. Now that sounds a lot like Mount Sinai again, and we start wondering, is this really just the same thing with a little bit of different window dressing? And the answer is no. There's no ropes around Mount Zion that would prohibit your capacity to get there. And it tells us that we come to Jesus, who's the mediator of a new covenant. You see, the idea, we have to understand that God is the judge of all. If we don't understand that, then we don't need Jesus. If God is just going to overlook every fault and failure, then we don't need someone to rescue us from the penalty or the pain of that. And so Jesus comes. See, uh, let's put, look at it like this. Love actually requires that justice be done. If you love someone... You want things to be done correctly for them. So let's suppose that you were walking down the road with a friend or a loved one, and as you're walking down the road, someone who is driving under the influence loses control of their vehicle, and they swerve and hit your friend or your loved one. 
They survive the experience, but they spend weeks or months in the hospital with all kinds of surgeries and corrective things having to be done. And there's just this incredible loss of capacity and ability, short term, maybe even long term. And so suppose you went into the courtroom and you looked at the judge who was uh, standing or about to give a sentence for the person responsible for this devastation done, done to your loved one. And the judge just looked at the person and said, well, they didn't die, so you're free to go. You would stand up and you'd say, hey, wait a minute. That's my friend. That's my family member. This person has robbed weeks, months, or maybe even years of capacity from their life. How can you just let them go? You see, love never responds with apathy. In fact, apathy is the exact opposite of love. Some people think it's hate. It's not. Hate is not the opposite of love. Apathy is. And God cannot be apathetic when it comes to human beings. He sees the injustice that's done in our world, but he also sees the injustice that occurs in our hearts. And that's the thing that we tend to be the most blind to. So at Mount Zion, God doesn't stop seeing all of the sin and calling it for what it is. At Mount Zion, there is actually someone who absorbs all the punishment and pays all the penalty. That's the distinction. At Mount Zion, Jesus pays the entire price and absorbs all of the punishment. So the question I have for you this morning, which mountain are you attracted to? Now, there's one thing I want to start with, and it's this comment. There is no way to protect your life from being shaken. There is no way to protect your life from being shaken. Uh, there's, there's shaking that occurs in terms of relationships, right? Uh, let's suppose that you're a person and, and you've observed what happens when people get too close and then things go wrong and you go, that's not going to happen to me. I'm going to be a loner. No one's ever going to hurt me. You don't need help to experience hurt. The voices inside your own head will raise such condemnation and such criticism of you, and you won't have anybody in your life to quiet them or neutralize them. You will believe the worst things you say about yourself, and that's something. So, well, okay, I'll have friends. Okay, so you've had some friends. How many have all the same friends you've ever had in your life? They didn't leave you, and you didn't leave them. Well, that was frustrating, wasn't it? it was a little bit of a, a shaking experience. And then sometimes we go, well, they're such a good friend, I'm going to marry that person. I'm going to spend the rest of my life with that person. Okay. Uh, I've done a lot of weddings. And I wish I could tell you that every wedding survives. Every marriage gets through all the challenges that they're going to face. But I've seen lots of marriages that don't survive. Sometimes people don't live up to the expectations. Sometimes they actually violate vows. And if you've ever been on the other side of those marriage vows being broken and processing the pain of divorce, you know it is a tremendously earth-shaking experience. But let's suppose your, your marriage actually survives all of those things and, it, and it's healthy and you love each other. Then unless you both die at the same exact time in the same exact accident, one of you is going to say goodbye to the other of you. And I promise you that will be a shaking experience. You, there is no way to stack your life so that you don't have any shaking. Think of it as a parent, right? Is there anything more tumultuous than parenting? I mean, so try it this way. Well, let's suppose a couple wants to have a child and they're struggling with infertility. I promise that will shake you. Or let's suppose that you actually are able to get pregnant and the child comes premature. That will shake you. Or there's some health issues in the child's life. That will shake you. Or the child grows up and starts making decisions that cause pain in your life. Or they're defiant and destructive to themselves. I promise that that will shake you. Or an accident occurs and they are injured. Or their life actually ends and you have to stand by an open grave and say your last goodbye. I promise that will shake you. And in case you think, well, I've actually seen them live through all of that. There will come a moment when they are looking in your eyes and seeing you die, and you will see the fear, fear in their eyes, and that will shake you too. There is no way you can protect your life from being shaken. And I know what you're saying right now. Dear God, Pastor, why did I come today? 
I came on a holiday. <laughs> Couldn't you work up a little bit of good news? And uh, yes, but not yet. <laughs> the mountain you choose determines your outlook. The mountain you choose determines your outlook. And we're confronted with two mountains, Mount Sinai, mountain one, and Mount Zion, mountain two. And in the first mountain, we perceive that God is doing something to us. It's just, it's how, when, when your entire connection and relationship with God is established by the rules you keep or fail to keep, you just interpret everything that happens in your life as an outflow and a blessing because you did something good, now God is doing something good for you, or if bad or difficult things are happening in your life, you must have gotten something wrong. I must have crossed some line. I must have made a mistake. I must have not done enough. And we start interpreting all of these things. And we start asking ourselves, does God even care what's happening in my life? You know, all of these things are happening. If God really loved me, would he allow these things to happen? So let me, let me ask you a question. Did God love his son, Jesus? And was that a suffering-free life? Hmm. Why does God allow cancer and addiction and divorce and accidents Someone got you because they were driving under the influence or you got someone because you were under the influence and it doesn't feel fair because the party you left, there were five people who were more intoxicated than you were but you were the one who had the accident and you're the one who got charged and you're the one who got convicted and now that thing follows you around and screws up your life in ways you can't possibly calculate. And why does God allow that? Life does not seem very fair. That's the first mountain mentality. That's how life gets interpreted. But there's a second mountain. And in the second mountain, we perceive God is doing something in us, not to us. Here's a question. Don't answer. Don't even look like you know the answer. But just think about it. If surviving and recovering from a serious health issue drew you closer to God than you've ever been, would you choose it? If getting a, through a season that drained every ounce of strength and energy you had out of you, but in that you discovered the strength of God available to you, would you choose it? If experiencing a great loss helped you understand spiritual gain, would you choose it? And here's the challenge. It is so easy to start seeing this from mountain one mentality as though God causes all these things in our life so that somehow we might learn some spiritual lesson. Let me just tell you right now, this is not heaven. This is a broken world and it's filled with lots of darkness and sharp edges and God doesn't have to cause anything for us to experience lots of things. So God has not come to do something to us. God has come to do something in us. And that's very, very different. So how can we move forward? If, if that's true, how do we process that? How do we, how do we allow the redemptive work that God is doing through those circumstances to be done in our hearts? And I think the first thing is remember what God has done for you. I mean, start at the cross. Look at what he's done for you. If you ever doubt the love of God, Look to the cross. He gave his one and only son. But don't stop there. Look at all the other ways that God has assisted you and strengthened you and supported you. He has, he's renewed your hope at times when you were completely discouraged. He's increased your vision when you couldn't see beyond the day. He's restored your health when you didn't think you'd be able to recover. And he's reconciled relationships when you thought they were forever gone. It's unbelievable what God has done. In fact, I would just encourage you, Open a note in your phone or start a journal or keep a card and just every time you notice a blessing of God in your life, a goodness from God in your life, write it down because there are going to be days you need to see that again. So 
Remember what God has done for you. And then just be honest about what you're experiencing. Faith does not require you to pretend anything. If something hurts, you can say it hurts. If you feel hopeless, you can say you feel hopeless. If you look through the Psalms, there's all kinds of songs that have been written that are laments where people are just crying their heart out to God and expressing how unfair life feels and how distant God seems. I promise you, God is big enough to handle any honest conversation you want to have with him. He really is. So be honest with what you're experiencing and then trust that God is working. Trust that God is working. I know you might not be able to see what he's doing, but he's working for you because he is for you. In John chapter 5, Jesus put it this way. My father is, what's the next word? always at his work to this very day God is always he doesn't take a day off of working on our behalf and in our lives just because you can't discern it or see it doesn't mean it's not happening he's working this is one of my favorite passages in the Old Testament it was written to a prophet whose name is hard to pronounce and he's not very well known his name is Habakkuk can everybody try that Habakkuk yeah, very good, all right? And this is what Habakkuk said. He, he's describing a famine-like experience, and he says, though the fig tree does not bud, and though there are no grapes on the vines, and though the olive crop fails, and the fields produce no food, food though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord, I will be joyful in God my Savior. He understands that his faith and his hope is in God, not in some outcome he desires. And he finishes it this way, the sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He enables me to tread on the heights that you can get from where you are to a better place because God will give you the solid footing step by step. It won't happen in a single bound, but he will get you through this. It's absolutely amazing. There was a 15-year-old who was processing, 15-year-old young man who was processing a very series of devastating blows in his life, and he was processing it from the mountain one experience. And he wrote a poem, and this is the poem. God doesn't love me. You can't force me to believe God is good. This is the one truth in life. This world is a product of chance. How can I believe that God will use my life? I know with certainty that God has left me. Never again will I say that Christ is risen from the dead. I know more now than ever in my life that man can save himself. We must realize that it is ignorant to think God answers prayers. Christians declare that without God, this world would fall into darkness. The world can and will meet my needs. It is a lie to say that God has always been there for me. I now realize that no matter what I do, the truth is he doesn't love me. How can I presume that God is good? That's a mountain one mentality. And here's what's fascinating. All you have to do is change the mountain that you're standing on and look at those exact same words from a different perspective. Let's start reading it from the bottom to the top. God is good. How can I presume that he doesn't love me? The truth is, no matter what I do, I now, I now realize that God has always been there for me. It is a lie to say that this world can and will meet my needs. Without God, this world would fall into darkness. Christians declare that God answers prayers. We must realize that it is ignorant to think a man can save himself. I know more now... I, let me try that again. I know now more than ever in my life that Christ is risen from the dead. Never again will I say, I know with certainty that God has left me. God will use my life. How can I believe that? This world, how can I believe that this world is a product of chance? This is the one truth in life. God is good. You can't force me to believe God doesn't love me. 
same words, different perspective. Who wants to live a mountain one when God has given us mountain two? Let's bow our heads this morning. So you, you might be here this morning and your pathway is broken and there's no signs. And you can't figure out for the life of you why you are where you are. I'm wondering if you're willing to take a perspective from Mountain 2 and allow God to lead you through something that you would have avoided. Maybe you're surrounded by darkness and you can't see any clear steps forward. God didn't have to cause this season in your life to work his redemptive purpose in it. What if he's at work right now? And what if the things you learn about him and about yourself are so much more powerful than anything you could have learned if your life had gone exactly as you had designed it? There are fiery trials. There are dark valleys. There are painful realities in this life. And we would protect ourselves from them if we could. And from mountain one, we wonder why God doesn't. But we have not come to a place where the ground shakes underneath our feet and we ask God to say no more to us. We've come to the place where the, the ropes are down and his arms are wide open. And he's come to do a work in you. Heavenly Father, this is a hard thing for us. We're so tempted to gravitate back to that first mountain and interpret everything in our lives based on that perspective. Would you help us to see you and all of life through the perspective of mountain two? You are at work doing amazing things in our lives right now. Right now. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand together.